And now, from the dark corners of the internet, where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the beer flows steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. This segment is sponsored by Palo Alto Networks, creators of the next generation firewalls, helping you enforce network security policies based on applications, users, and content. Visit them on the web at paloaltonetworks.com. And by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit them on the web at www.sans.org to learn more. Now it's time to fire up a packet capture and pour yourself a beer because... Time to give the intern control of your botnet. No, no. In fact, here is your host, a man who did in fact sniff something other than packets during the intro to this show, Paul Asadorian. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Paul Security Weekly. This is episode 388 for Thursday, September 18th, 2014, on the cusp of DerbyCon. Very close. And by something different, I mean I farted. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and in uh, honor of, not that, but in honor of DerbyCon, for whatever reason, because Jack and I decided we were going to wear our kilts to DerbyCon, and in honor of quite possibly what might be the independence of Scotland from Great yes. Britain, if I understand the news correctly, right? Te well, technically from the United Kingdom. United Kingdom. Um, so, yeah. We're wearing kilts, but you can't see them because we're sitting down, so... But we'll see. Maybe. I mean, there's, yeah, a, there's kilt a kilt here. Yeah, there's a kilt. See, kilt. you got you to hold here. it like. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, we're going to do a traditional Scottish dance in between segments. So stay tuned for that. We're uh, just waiting for the sheep to arrive. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <sighs> Speaking just of sheep. Just had to go there, right? I mean, why, why wait? <laughs> <laughs> the PVS contest from Tenable you can register at the link in the show notes and enter to win a contest for an uh, enter to win an AR drone. You must use PVS to find something cool. The details are on the registration page, which is linked to in the show notes. Um, I did that already. If you missed it, I did a webcast. It was awesome. Um, Sands Las Vegas, October 26th through the 27th. I will debut a new course titled Embedded Security Device Assessments for the Rest of Us, which will teach students how to assess embedded systems in a variety of penetration tests and in your duties as a security professional. You can register at a link in the show notes or go to securityweekly.com forward slash IOT to register today. It's going to be awesome. You should take my class. I wrote a blog post on the subject based on my interview that I did with Patrick Gray. That was a really good blog post, by the way. Oh, thank I must you. Say, I must thank say. you. It was a good interview with Patrick, too. Yeah, yeah. that's well, those were basically that I took the notes from the interview with Patrick and I turned them into a blog post. That's episode 336 of Risky Business. If you go to blog.tenable.com, you can see it's uh, still there on the homepage. Um, and all those topics and more will be covered in my two-day class at SANS. So please register today. Security Weekly listeners get a 10% off discount code for that class, SECWEEK10, S-E-C-W-E-E-K-10, for that class. So it's a no-brainer, right? I mean, of course. Of course. And anyone else is I mean a no-brainer? I mean, that's not that the class is a no-brainer. You actually no. have to have a brain to take the class. Yes. Uh, uh, Larry will also be at the same conference, uh, SANS Security Indeed. 617 Wireless <coughs> Ethical hacking, hacking, even Penetration Testing yep. and Defense, October 20th through the 25th. Time is running out. Come get signed up, please. Yes. So, okay. Awesome time. Get Larry for six days. Get me for two days. What could be better than that? That's what I'm saying. Um, you cannot purchase Hack Naked t-shirts at shop.securityweekly.com. Um... We'll be suspending all orders until after DerbyCon, where we may actually be out of stock. Whoa. So make sure you come see us at DerbyCon to get your Hack Naked t-shirt for the low price of $10. And then in which case, I don't know what we're going to do for next year. It's a secret because we haven't figured it out yet. Likely, maybe we'll print more black shirts with the white Hack Naked logo, or I don't know. 
Or so. something completely different. Or maybe something completely different. Who knows? Security Weekly Kilts? Security Weekly Kilts. Could be. Um, that's all I had for announcements. Our interview for this evening, who's actually his second time appearing on Security Weekly. Is that right, Mike? I saw you were yes. in there before. Yes. Hard key exploitation, right. Yes. This is your second appearance. Um, Mike has 20 years experience in IT and information security. In the past life, he's been a consultant for HP. He now focuses his talents as a blue team defender. Um, Michael also runs B-Sides Texas with uh, the lovely Michelle Klinger and leads B-Sides Austin Conference held in March. So, Mike, that's all I was going to read for you. If there's anything else you want to tell us about yourself, please do. Well, that's about it. That sums it up. I have a blog that people can read my rants, and uh, we have some material we'll share that I believe you're going to put in the show notes as well. So that'll pretty much uh, cover it. Excellent. So, Mike, uh, I know the topics were kind of open-ended, but you wanted to talk specifically about malware and some of these recent point-of-sale breaches. Yeah, you know, Jack and I were having a conversation in uh, Vegas, and I have sent him an email about some rants about logging. Um, one of the things that really kind of surprised me at Black Hat this year uh, just before I went and talked to you guys and, and had a discussion about defenders and such, was there were three log vendors on the floor at Black Hat in the vendor area, but yet there wasn't a single talk on logging in at all in Black Hat. And ironically, the only log talk that occurred was at uh, DEF CON as a fill-in talk. And uh, that really surprised me with everything that's going on and all the breaches we've seen that uh, there's not a lot of coverage right now in the con space to address or educate the people about this. Now, I've lived through uh, with, with the company I previously was at, a very large uh, APT event, uh, which eventually led to Kaspersky publishing the report on WinNTI. And um, in January, I analyzed the target malware and said, this couldn't have been that hard to detect. And so one thing led to another, I recreated the payload, uh, a benign version of the payload, executed it on my test environment, and uh, the amount of noise it made was was significant. And I'm one of the few people that love malware. I love the file concept of the malware and the payloads and, and detecting it. But I also love the fact that once you detect malware, uh, you need a behavior detection, which is what logs are really good for. And I was real disappointed at Vegas on the lack of defensive cons. Now, granted, uh, exploitation with DEF CON is a given and hackery and all that. But we had B-Sides, we had uh, uh, Passwords Con. I didn't attend any of those talks, so I don't know about that one. And, and Black Hat, I was really kind of surprised at the lack of, of I can go back to work and actually help defend my environment kind of talks. And I actually heard that a couple times from people saying, oh, this is great. I can't take this back to work and do anything with it, but nice talk. And, and that wasn't solicited by me, but that, that kind of was a feeling that I had others that shared. I went, you know what? I got to reach out to you guys. We got to talk about this subject and, and get people some resources and, and tell people this is not that hard to do. And Home Depot's a, a sad excuse in regards to not being able to detect something that was very well known. Uh, six, eight months later, and so, so that's, uh, Mike, that's why I reached um, out to you. Go back to when you had the malware in your lab. What were some of the indicators that there were malware? Like what sorts of logs and what made those logs different from the billions of other logs that you might see in an average in enterprise environment? Right. So um, the one thing we need to understand about the environments is uh, let's separate the environments into maybe three areas. We've got workstations, right, user space. You know, all of us are using our laptops, desktops. We go and visit all kinds of nefarious places. And that desktop environment for logging is much different than a server environment for logging, which is potentially different than an application space like a POS environment. POSs are static, right? They don't do much but POS stuff. They may have some additional features, but they do a function. And the behavior of that is very deterministic. They process this thing, it passes through this device, it generates this kind of pattern, and that's pretty much it. So if you look at the logs of that information, you can very quickly determine that what's normal is this stuff, what's not normal is this other stuff. So for example, when I played with the uh, target malware, I came across uh, the fact that something was executed. So in Windows logs, these are Windows machines, that's a 4688 new process started uh, event log and a 592 in XP. Um, so clearly they executed, 
the net command, they executed, you know, attached shares, they executed command.exe, they executed the malware. All these things generate a 4688 event. Now, one of the things that people should understand about logging is, and, and comments I know that have been made by some of the panel, logging's hard. You turn it on or you don't, and how do I get started? If you've ever lived through an APT attack or had to track down um, somebody actively on a network, in our case, we actually left them on certain devices so that we could make sure we enabled everything we could. And we found very quickly that certain defaults in Windows don't allow you to see what you really need to see. And so we started flipping those bits in AD, flipping GPO, uh, turning on some auditing. And once we did that, their behavior became so incredibly apparent and it only takes about six event IDs, just six, to detect the kind of behavior these POS systems are exhibiting. One of which, launching of, of stuff. You see that in every Windows box, something ran. But also the fact that accounts logged in. Um, what accounts log in and what behavior? When you do backup jobs, the accounts log in during this period of time. If that account gets compromised, it wouldn't be at 8 in the morning or 9 in the morning. It'd be at 10 at night when you launched your backups. So you could look for that kind of combination of behavior. This executable uh, happened, and this kind of account started doing some nefarious business or just something. You don't know it's nefarious at this point. A share was accessed. It's very uncommon unless an administrator is going box to box to box to box that you would have something connecting to a lot of shares in an environment that also had a process that also had a service install. And it's this combination of things, a 4688 new process, a 4624 login event, a 50, these are all Win7 events, a 5140 uh, share access, a 4634 disconnect, meaning I connected to a POS system, I did my thing and I disconnected. A lot of times the connections occur, but the disconnection doesn't occur because we're mapping a drive permanently, like our home drives or, or Paul connecting to Jack's machine for the entire day. But this nefarious behavior is very spiky. It says, I'm going to connect, I'm going to execute something, I'm going to disconnect, and and away I go to the next one. And so you see this this pattern occurring. The other thing is a service installing. It's very uncommon for a new service to be installed in Windows unless you are patching something or installing a new service. Change management should tell you, hey, this is a POS. It's a static system. I shouldn't see a lot of change here. As a matter of fact, these are the services we use. I can look at the logs, filter those out with whatever log management solution there is, and say, okay, if any new services are installed, alert me. And that's a 7045. Well, and, and that course, one, you know, that one sends a, a red flag, especially if you're not patching your point of sale systems. Especially if you're not patching. Uh, the new service is a 601 in XP environments. And so uh, service has got to be a huge indicator of a compromise in, in any static system, whether it's a specialized application server or POS system or kiosk, something that just doesn't have a lot of user change. Um, and also... Uh, you know, typical servers, workstations, users do a lot of stuff, so it may not be as great as indicator. You have to look at more items. Now, the, Mike, the last is it, item is file there, auditing, something nobody turns on for the most part, but that is a huge uh, capability in logs that people do not exploit that I, I can't speak enough of, almost kind of tripwire-ish in some aspects. Some new file got dropped in this <clears> location. <throat> And I'm sorry, there are just no executables in app data local roaming. Um, so any executable that shows up in app data local roaming or percent app data percent is clearly an indication of nefarious activity. But now, Mike, if I'm if I have a hundred thousand point of sale devices, and I'm collecting this detailed level of logging, uh, I, am I going to need some kind of tool to sift through all that data on an ongoing basis, especially? Well. Most of these larger organizations, we have to assume, are going to have some sort of log management. So everybody get their beer ready, right? So uh, PCI requires you to have this. <laughs> assuming all wow, these, it's a good uh, thing we got some nice, know. strong cocktails for that. I didn't get one of those nice, strong cocktails, and I'm almost out of beer. I got one here for you. I got a couple of different flavors of Sierra Nevada if we can virtually drink it. Yeah, I just so, my beer. Um, <laughs> I'll hook you up next round. So, so we digress. I know you will, Jack. I know you. I need a muddler, though. That's not... <laughs> yeah, never mind. <laughs> Phrasing! <laughs> Sorry, Mike. Jack yeah. is muddling. <laughs> yes. my, my, so never PCI mind. says we have to... There we go again. have to drink again. So they say uh. that, that compliance document... 
says we're required to have some sort of log management capability. Now, we won't debate what log management is or what a sim is, um, but nevertheless, it is the collections of logs from a local device to a centralized location. So, yes, you probably need a tool in a big environment that has 100,000. If you didn't, then you deserve to get uh, pwned, in, in my uh, professional opinion, probably all of yours. But you could, if need be, run a command line if you so want to enable PowerShell across your environment, uh, which may or may not be a good thing, and looks like Microsoft's driving us to that, that area. Then you could run a script using Windows Event Utility or even PowerShell to harvest looking for specific event IDs in the logs, if you found that, let's say you did a comparison, you know, run this command line, looking for 4663s, nope, didn't have any this hour, run it every hour, every day, whatever you think is appropriate for your environment or the type of environment it is. Hell, every day would have been way better than, what, eight months. And then compare that to the last time you ran it, and if there was a change from the command line perspective, you know, file A compared to file B, hey, suddenly uh, we get this POS.exe on these POSs. Does anybody know about this? No, there's no tickets in for change. Uh, I could email that. I could drop it into a share, which could be monitored by a web, you know, just a simple browser pointing to a location looking for files. But do you need a tool? No. Do most of the people in PCI requirements have to have one? Yes. Uh, are they utilizing them? Definitely not to the obvious capability that they should be exploited. Now, Mike, some behavior is pretty easily identifiable based on the current trends. For example, we know that malware today is doing X, Y, Z. But three to six months from now, malware could be doing something completely different. So how does the person defending the environment keep up on what they should be tuning their log event management and correlation tools um, to do, uh, you know, how do you keep up with that? That's an excellent question. So all of us here are obviously uh, well familiar with vulnerability management. Uh, we basically get alerts and, and bulletins and, and, you know, potentially patches from our vendors notifying us that there's an issue and we go about patching and or unfortunately not enough of the time do they include remediation, temporary remediation of it. Microsoft's really bad at that. But we go about... Uh, potentially remediating the issue and then again deploying the patch you know obviously uh, heart bleed deploy the patch or flip your WAF to block these kinds of requests and you remediate the problem until you can patch it right so that's vulnerability management in a nutshell you guys do it with tenable um, and you guys actually have this uh, this nefarious uh, auto run capability where you look in certain auto runs and and you report on that as a part of your scans um, so we're well familiar with vulnerability management uh, we defined a concept that we came out of uh, this APT attack that we suffered, and we call it the malware management framework. It is basically vulnerability management, but with malware. So if you were to go back and look, um, and here's an example of a spreadsheet. Uh, I have a copy of this on a blog. We'll talk about it here. But I've got the malwares uh, across the top, and I've got uh, tidbits or indicators along the side. And what you do with this is you take the reports, whether it is uh, the report on Black POS in the case that I did in, in Target, was published January 14, 2014, uh, by Eyesight Partners, and I analyze what's in the report. So it tells me uh, if it's written well enough that the malware was found here, it was th named these things, uh, it, it exhibited these kinds of behaviors. And you look at these reports and you say, okay, the malware did this stuff, this combination of things. Now, if we just take the January malware and we go all the way back to Flamer or Stuxnet, which is on this spreadsheet that I published on the blog uh, for people to use as a beginning point, and you practice malware management, what you'll do is you'll read each one of these. So I've got uh, Mini Flame, Zero Access, uh, SDBot, um, uh, the, I have the NVIDIA stuff, which we renamed it to WinNTI is what the official name became, uh, Gauss, Flamer, Duco, Stuxnet. We got Black POS on this thing. Um, what else do we have on here? Crypto Locker, another big one. That's where the executable was dropped in the root of uh, percent app data percent, uh, definitely an indicator. And you start marking the, the directory locations that files are dropped. You look at the file types that are that are added. For example, uh, Gauss uh, dropped seven OCX files in System32. There are only five by default. Uh, so if you're not looking for additional OCX files in System32, uh, that's an easy indicator to have caught that, you know, 
basically state-sponsored uh, APT. You look at the file types, the extensions, and again, I don't need to know anything about it, no hash, because that can change in a heartbeat. I look at uh, the kind of things it does, uh, what injection things it does, and I start monitoring those scenarios. File types, I can easily look for anything executable. That's what I'm focusing on. If it's an executable and it shows up in these locations, I don't care what iteration of all the malwares I just mentioned, you would catch it because it's an additional file that's been added to the system. And if, so if you practice malware management, the concept is take all we know, throw that out, the hay, and what's left is a few pieces of hay, a few pieces of grass, a few tidbits, and this potentially bad stuff. And you, you do this repetitively every time these, these reports come out, or even read the secure list uh, virus descriptions, you will see a pattern that hasn't really changed since the beginning of time with malware. It affects the user space, what, what you basically type set at the command prompt, see all the variables there, percent temp, percent app data. They infect the user space, they hit the reg keys, and in the admin space, they've got to inject into Windows, so they're going to uh, impact the Windows, System32, and WBM directories very heavily. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter what malware you have, they all have to do these things from a file perspective. The behavior part is a user clicked on something, something executed, new process. If I get on the box and I jump from box A to box B, I've got to make a connection. That's going to execute known Windows commands, right? We uh, heard the podcast last, last week about PowerCat, like the NetCat thing. Well, we're going to see those things executing. And so that behavior is, well, I know this is normal stuff, so let's just look for the stuff that's not normal. And you put these combinations together saying, I want to know if a command exe executed in a short period of time with net.exe, ping, IP config, uh, PowerShell, PSExec, you name it, netstat, mptsat, uh, cscript, sysprep, a, a known injection location with crypt-based DLL. And you look for these things executing in a, in within an hour's period of time. Your APT or these targeted attacks will light up like a Christmas tree. And they're really no different today that they were 10 years ago. So, but wait, Mike, don't I have antivirus on those systems? I think you have to drink for that one. Yeah. <laughs> not, not only that, but first of all, on these point-of-sale systems, half the time you don't. You don't control the devices. Yeah. Well, and then, I, and then that assumes that you're not the first one targeted before the pattern matches, right? Mm -hmm. And that assumes that you've actually updated your shit because everybody updates their sh oh, Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so let's give you an example of AV. So... We found this APT uh, in uh, basically June 2012. It was first reported by Kaspersky in, in April 2013, uh, formerly named WinNTI. We didn't have a name for it. Uh, they picked on the NVIDIA name set, so we called it NVIDIA. But nonetheless, um, this malware um, was, was pretty APT-ish. I mean, it did a lot of sneaky things, including a, a non-disk file, in-memory only kind of item. And... We looked at this stuff and we said, all right, you know, what is it doing? How is it doing it? Well, I just read a report that, that Symantec was not updated at Home Depot. Okay, so they're blaming the fact that this stuff was, hadn't been updated, hadn't been rolled out. So wait a minute. So what does a real APT look like and, and what kind of detection rate did we get? So we had about 25 files in the course of about a year, year and a half that we got from these attackers. They still beat on us and uh, on the company. The gaming environment is very heavily attacked, uh, probably one of the most so in the, in the world. Um, and you upload these things to the vendors. We uploaded the original payloads to 12 vendors. One of the vendors came back and said, absolutely not malware. Uh, well, you know, I had a lot of fun with that. I have a friend that works there, and I had a lot of fun with that one when it did come out and got published finally, and, and this is what we expect. They're not driven to detect the 80% of unique malware. Sophos reported 70% of malware is unique to one company. 80% uh, is unique to 10 or less companies. So the AV industry is really focusing at 20% of the total malware, but it's probably 80% of the noise we see getting hit by, you know, phishing, the stuff that gets blocked in our, you know, SMTP gateways, our AV engines with signatures, etc. In 2013, there were 110 million pieces of new malware. There's only 100,000 files on a Windows system, but yet there were 110 million new pieces of malware. AV can't keep up with that. And so to, to think that AV could deal with those kind of changes and, and uh, do a good job is just no longer a reasonable, reasonable idea. And they know what we know. They know the stuff doesn't work. They just change one bit in the file, recompile it, and boom, it's, it's bypassed AV. 
we had uploaded all this malware to VirusTotal. The only reason we got a 3% detection rate was because one of the pieces of malware they sent us via fish got detected multiple times, like two or three times on, on virus total, but yet did not get detected by the AV we were using. So they knew which AV we had. And so they knew it would bypass our AV. But that's the only reason we got 3%. So the reality is it's more like zero when it's these targeted attacks, must like obviously the POS software is, is proven to do. But wait, you mean people don't update their antivirus either? Doesn't matter if you did. Our antivirus is up to date with our APT attack. As a matter of fact, some of the APT wasn't detected for over a year after we submitted the samples to 12 vendors. <gasps> some still does not get detected. Um, that's how little effort they give towards these, these tactical events. If they don't have a customer spending a lot of money on their environment, they're not going to spend the lab resources to go reverse it and create a signature. They're going to wait till the repository that they all share uh, gets distributed, and they're just going to suck that up. That's why when you look at certain descriptions of viruses, you see very little information. It's because it's a copy of something someone else had done, and they just added it to their repository. They think it's important. Hmm. So what are you, <clears throat> what are your, like, top three things, recommendations for defenders to detect this targeted malware in their environments? Well, the first thing is go read my blog and some of the stuff I publish in this space. So uh, the number one thing is is understand everybody needs to start somewhere. And I know uh, Jack's made mention on the, on the podcast before and a lot of people in our industry, you know, I worked at HP, ArcSight implementations and such. Uh, logging can be a ginormous problem to people. They just, they look at the, the amount of data that's there and they're like, what do I look for? So here's, here's where to start. Number one, you got to learn how to enable and configure the logs properly to collect things. Now, we made that easy by coming up uh, as a part of our APT efforts. We came up with this Windows logging cheat sheet. It's in the show notes. It's six pages, and it's pretty much uh, a great starting point. Uh, it's not six pages of events. It's enabling, configuring, the description of how to set the audit policy. Uh, you should do all this through GPO, obviously. But we're also discussing command line for those that have to do it old school. And you start there. If you're not doing what's in that Windows cheat sheet for a small, medium, or ginormous organization, you are going to fail in regards to logging. Um, every auditor on the planet, PCI, and I got a drink, or otherwise, should be checking to see if you are actually collecting these events and using intelligence. Now, what do I do with this? So I came up with the sexy six. And the sexy six are the ones we just read for the target breach. 4688 or 592 for new processes, 4624 or 528, 540 for an account logging in, and by the way, uh, Egypt had said this a couple years ago at DEF CON. He asked the audience, how many people here log for successful login attempts? And like a dozen of us out of several thousand people raised our hands. You look for failed, but no, you need to look for successful. Still? This is something we talked about like at SANS conferences in 1999. Yeah, but it's just, it's just not done. Remember, no. by default, the stuff's not turned on. I think you'd be really surprised if you went and looked at our cheat sheet and went and looked at a default Windows box. You're going to find half the stuff in there is not turned on by default. Yeah, did I mention Windows sucks? Just saying. Yeah, and what's so, the one thing to be aware of is... Is that Windows sucks? What? Yeah, <laughs> when, you turn on, when you turn on all the logging and file monitoring and you're using your corporate image on Windows XP, the resource... Yeah. Utilization is a little high, but yeah, the, the if you aren't tracking successful logins, how do you know that somebody failed six times and succeeded the seventh, which is freaking terrifying, right? You know, three times and and then you log in is because you have a good password and you haven't had your coffee or you've had too many beers. You know, six or seven fails oh, yeah. and a success, or you know, twenty three if you don't have lockouts and a success. If you're not monitoring success, you don't know that, and that one requires no thought whatsoever like you're t like you're talking about michael this is there are things like that that uh, that don't require a lot of thought is it bad that somebody tried unsuccessfully 23 times and then immediately succeeded in logging in yes yes it is here's the interesting thing we found um these these people that target us uh, believe it or not <laughs> are very good they're equally as good as the infamous uh, social engineering test always succeeds the pen test you know how many Paul, Larry, you guys, how many pen tests have you worked on that have not succeeded? What percentage? Less than five? Way less than five. Way yeah. less than 
five. Way less than five. So this is how they work. Their APT is that good. They target us personally. They get a compromised credential. They go to LinkedIn. They buy LinkedIn access like HR does. They know who we are. They target us personally, professionally. They're very well crafted, and they just need one admin to, to, to get compromised. Once they do that, there is no failed login attempt. They have the credential. And at that point, they start jumping around. And they're very good at going from patient zero to patient one, from patient one, making it look like patient zero and infecting your environment, leaving that back door that they initially got in at. In fact, Mike, I, I've heard threat <clears throat> intelligence companies talk about how there are entire groups of people who do nothing but collect intelligence about organizations and then sell that to the uh -huh. other people who do the compromising. Yeah, I'm absolutely positive on that. Gaming environment, uh, I got stories for you. So... The, uh, the idea of, of whether or not you're looking for, uh, you know, failed to success might be good in a brooding scenario on the internet, but I, internally you're really looking at successful logins that don't belong. Admins log into servers. They rarely, domain admins rarely go to, to desktops, smaller environments, more may, may that be the case. But when you're looking at a, at a very broad uh, infection that's hitting a, a ginormous amount of uh, percentage, Jar numbers meaning anything more than five percent of your organization. They, what, what the hell's Bill and Bob going and hopping on all these workstations for? He's a server admin. Or what's this desktop admin going to these servers for? He's a desktop admin. It becomes very apparent through these successful logins that something's not right. Um, accounts that may have been disabled, they re-enable and then use that, like an old AV account, whatnot. So successful logins, real important on 4634. The uh, new service, right, the, the sexy six, 7045601, 70, new service installed. These six items, uh, 4663, 567, auditing, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, those six items, I would say, if you're going to start a rollout, these are the six you should focus on. Use our Windows logging cheat sheet. Get the GPO stuff turned on. There are a couple caveats. If you and I, I really love it. I have it turned on all over my stuff. Um, turning on Windows Firewall or the packet filter stuff in Windows Firewall will generate nine to ten thousand events an hour. Now that's great if you have a lot of disk space. Um, today the CPU on disks of servers are just you don't even see the blip. I've I've fully enabled logging on a Windows box, a, a desktop as well as a server, and it doesn't even notice the difference until you turn on something like uh, Windows packet filtering for the Windows firewall, and all those generate a little more disk activity. But our systems are so fast today, that just doesn't have an impact. But if you're collecting it in a log management, you do have to take into account, if you want to do this right, you better index really well. This is the stuff I want, this is the stuff I don't want, and never exclude stuff by event code. That is absolutely the wrong way to exclude data. So. Three things. Enable and configure your stuff per the Windows logging cheat sheet. Gather and harvest it per that cheat sheet as well, but also focus, get started on the sexy six. If you do these things right there alone and you look at the spreadsheet that we shared in the show notes, you are going to see pretty much every large APT attack that I've ever analyzed because it will trigger these things. And you now, do have to go and Mike, filter out the good. Yeah, getting back to how you analyze those, is there a once you enable all that stuff, what, what are you using to analyze those logs to pull out? The well, I'm a Splunk fan, and I also right here have a big old Alien Vault uh, appliance that I'm, I'm presently trying to configure and getting it into the same kind of configuration I do with Splunk. For those that don't know, you can go to SplunkStorm.com and get a free account in Splunk and upload 5 gigs of data a month, which will pretty much handle two or three PCs fully loaded logging, no problem, and load the Splunk agents on your machines and practice quite a bit. And you can upload this stuff. So I'm a Splunk fan. Uh, our company runs Splunk. Several companies I work for have had Splunk. But the concept's the same. I look at services and I'm like, yep, that's my compact driver. Yep, that's my HP driver. Yep, that's my you know backup solution. Yep, that's my this, that's my that. And you get rid of it. And what you're looking at is anytime a new service, oh, NVIDIA just updated. Yeah, I got to get rid of the NVIDIA stuff. Maybe, maybe not, because NVIDIA is pretty noisy. And you filter out this stuff, not this .exe and this directory, not, what does he got here, a loot, a loot cup? May, the, may oh, the farce be with you? Yeah, no, it's it's just a Star Wars, generic Star Wars cup. My, and, my, and my Starbucks branded hack naked mug is, I, I can't find it right now. I got your sticker right there. I see that. I saw that. That's, one bump, that's the big bumper sticker. You're one of the lucky ones to get those. I was just thinking as I'm looking at that sticker, we need to print more of those. 
and you start filtering out the stuff that's good, right? It's the it's the the adage uh, Gates made f famous, right? We have the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns, right? The known knowns, you guys are definitely going to interject some com some comedic comments, and we're going to get sidetracked. The known unknowns is somebody's going to say something, and Larry or Paul is going to run with it. Uh, we have no idea what's going to come out of out of their mouths. And then there's the unknown unknowns. I have no idea what the hell's going to happen. And looking at a log events or malware's very similar. No knowns are AV signatures. Known unknowns are behavior. Unknown unknowns is what we're focusing on. Yeah, I know, know what now, I Mike, know. You know what we're wearing underneath our kilts is an unknown unknown. <laughs> Just saying. Let's hack naked, right? So <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's. I mean, uh, if you're gonna wear a kilt, it's commando. not that unknown. It's, it's only one thing to wear under your kilt. Oh, when I Socks. It's a bow. <laughs> <laughs> if you're wearing something under your kilt, it'd be called a skirt. Just saying. So you basically How's at this point you ball? filter out <laughs> the knowns. And you basically say, this is what's normal in my POS. This is what's normal in my server. They're static, people. They don't do much. Users are not, in not interacting with these things every day, every hour. They do their function. They're a DHCP server. They're a Win server. They're a, a mail server. They're a file server. They're a this server, or that server, an app server, a WordPress server, whatever. And that's what they do. And it's very easy to filter out that noise in a, in a good log management solution so that what's left is... Okay, go go enable PS exec on that machine and execute it, and you should have an entry pop up. That's what you're after. If I go to that box and, and execute net use, boom, I'm going to get an entry. That's what I'm after. If I drop a new executable on that box and I hit enter, boom, my log my logging should show me that condition. And then you set up alerts, not dashboards, but alerts that email the people the right things. And those six items that that are in my blog and and in this uh, that I mentioned are the things that people should start at. That's the that's the stuff you should focus at in regards to getting rid of the noise. There's lots more in that cheat sheet, but that's a good place to start from a log perspective. From a file perspective, the third thing is start monitoring directories. Okay, folks, every user-based malware affects percent app data percent and percent temp. Look for executables in those directories, period, hands down. They're going to modify the run keys. You guys look for that stuff in Nessus, lots of other tools. Look for the mods in these things. Not every piece of malware will, will do it that way, but 90 plus percent of, of it will. Uh, what was it John Strand was uh, doing the SANS defer Monterey uh, stuff, and they asked him to pen test, not the way he normally does, but the way that they do it, that Bob would do it, because that's the reality, right? That's the thing we're trying to detect. And he had to actually change his pen test behavior, he had stated on that, to reflect the actual behavior. And so that's how you have to think, and you have to say, okay, I want to look for these things. And what locations are those? Go read the reports. If you look at any of the big APT reports, they're injecting with Explorer. If there's a DLL that uh, sits next to explorer.exe that Explorer loads, that's normally in System32, it will load in, in Windows first, the Windows directory first, and then it will call the good one in System32. And that's how they inject when a user logs in. If they want to do it with WMI, because everybody monitors server performance with WMI, they drop a DLL, nothing more, one DLL into the <coughs> WMI directory, drop a couple more in the System32 directory. When WMI starts, it has a list of DLLs that it goes and loads. That DLL is in that local WBM directory. Boom, it executes. You need to understand those things and monitor for those items. And System32 was heavily exploited by this POS software. If you're not looking for ads, not changes, but ads to those directories, you're doing something wrong. And we really need to move our focus at this detection because clearly we're getting our ass kicked by lack of security engineering in, uh, in that aspect. So, Mike, your uh, links your blogs are in the show notes yes okay they're all as, there Every, everything as well there. as the uh, windows cheat sheet the spreadsheet and uh there's probably something else in regards Ooh. to it we also my partner and i've developed a malware discovery tool which utilizes this concept that uh, you can use for free it's a freemium model but you can download and, and use to to find malware on your box <clears throat> that's awesome all those links are in the show notes for our listeners i encourage you to check them out it's great information Mike, are you now ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Of course. Three words to describe yourself. Advanced persistent pest. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? 
poison. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Pwned. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Absolutely first and third. Pick two celebrities to be your parents. Uh, I gave this one a lot of thought. Mm. So imagine the debates and the discussions that would occur in this household. Clearly Jack Daniel and Wendy Nather. <laughs> Why would that be? An oh. 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 Wow. 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 Mike you're, you're went with <laughs> your security celebrities you, for his you, parents. You're imagining that right now, aren't <laughs> you? <laughs> <laughs> Who's uh. your daddy? Jack Daniel. Nuff said. Nuff said. Now wait. Now that means I probably would not have gotten into security. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Steered away. Although you know what, my son is in security, uh, so uh, he's just insecure. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> well, that's all of us, right? Right. right. Short of security. <laughs> well, Mike, thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. It was good chatting with you. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Thanks, Mike. Thank you. And we're going to take a short break and come back with Pony Express. We've got fabulous prizes to give away. We've got fabulous devices to talk about. Um, I think this one fits in the pocket of my kilt, actually. And you know, and I will say this whole kilt thing. Yeah, it's uh, it's actually kind of nice because it is warm. However, this is a wool kilt. You are sweating under there, and you know it's what? making my ass itch. Yeah. <laughs> How thick is your kilt? Thank you for very, sharing that. Very thick. We're gonna get some baby powder, and we'll be right back. <laughs> Cornstarch. <laughs>